Like any of our better Reformed Forum episodes, we're bringing together many different disciplines and themes. And we're connecting here anthropology, soteriology, Christology, and eschatology, all theologies. And of course, all of these have a firm foundation in theology proper. So it's no accident we've been speaking about Trinitarian theology these, this weekend as well. So we will endeavor in this last address, our last time together, uh, here at this conference at least, to draw all of these together. I hope to try to wrap them up and try to present to you kind of a, kind of a comprehensive understanding of the image of God and its future. So I have several questions for us to pose, and we'll come back around at the end, not only answer some of them now in cursory fashion, but come back around at the end to see how we can understand these questions and answers even more fully. But you'll see there in the handout, under God's program of image conformity, what does God desire? What does God desire? Why is he involved with us, for example? Well, God desires that we would be brought into a heightened communion bond with him in glory, in glorious fashion. So how is that possible? Well, God gives the gift of himself, union and communion with him, and he also perfects our creaturely capacity to receive that gift. He's communicating to us not just things, but a personal relationship. Not making us into gods at all, but entering into and bringing us, more or less, drawing us into participation even in God's own life. That's a covenantal bond that he's perfecting. So how does God achieve this? Well, namely by conforming us to the image of Christ, our Savior. But then the question is, well, which image is the pattern to which we are being conformed? We know it's Christ's image, but which one? Is it his as image of the invisible God? Is it the image of Adam before the fall? That perf perfect, supposedly, or some would say neutral image in the garden. Is it the image of Christ upon his incarnation? Or upon the commencement of his messianic ministry? Is that the image to which we're being conformed? No, we are being conformed to the image of Christ first in his sufferings, so that we too might share in his subsequent glory. We are being conformed into the image of our Savior, crucified and raised. So let us consider then the glory of that image, the glory and the image of God. So in short, when we're speaking about glory, I like to speak about glory a lot, but sometimes that word gets used rather loosely and differently by different people at different times. In short, God's glory for our purposes today is his essence. It is the sum of total of his eternal attributes. But for a more thorough understanding, a maybe practical and concrete example, we can consider a verse such as Paul's words in Romans 1.20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So God's glory then, his invisible attributes, who he is, has been evident in the things that have been made because they reveal and they manifest his being. Created things and disclose his eternal attributes, not as original sources of divine being, but as derivative demonstrators of God's being in accommodated form. And this is true especially of man's constitutive being, who man is. We reveal God not as original revealers, but as derivative demonstrators of God's being in accommodated form. Now, basic to the notion of Christian anthropology is the teaching, as we've been speaking about all weekend, that Adam was created in the image of God. An image itself is bound up with the notion of God's glory, because man manifests God's glory precisely as image. Now, much has been written regarding man being created in the image of God, but little has connected that image to an eschatological conception of glory bestowed. Yes, there was a hyphen there. Glory bestowed. Meredith Klein is a welcome exception. Though he relates it to, Klein distinguishes slightly between image and glory as, and I quote, twin models in the Bible for expressing man's likeness to the divine original. If they are to be distinguished, the distinction might be that image likeness is reproduction of the original and glory likeness 
is reflection of the original. Now, both concepts for Klein and for us today have an eschatological dimension. Original archetypal glory, so much of which uh, Dr. Tipton was speaking about, is comprehensive. And when man is made to be like the glorious God and to reflect the divine glory as created copies, not as archetypes, but as ectypes, we should anticipate that this glory encompassing all aspects of human existence, this glory will encompass all aspects of human existence, not just part of our life. But we reflect and image God in all aspects of our life, at least we ought to. And this is precisely what Klein develops. Let me quote, under the concept of man as the glory image of God, the Bible includes functional or official, formal or physical, and ethical components corresponding to the composition of the archetypal glory. Functional glory likeness is man's likeness to God in the possession of official authority and in the exercise of dominion. Ethical glory is reflection of the holiness, righteousness, and truth of the divine judge not just the presence of a moral faculty of any religious orientation whatsoever. And formal physical glory likeness is man's bodily reflection of the theophonic and incarnate glory. That's true even for Adam in the garden, uh, being a kind of a prototypical uh, anticipation of the incarnate glory to come in Jesus Christ. So Klein likes to bring together all of these features, and he does so by demonstrating that this glory image is thoroughly eschatological. It's not static, but it's going somewhere. It has an eschatos, a finality, an end. We could say it's even teleological. It has a purpose and a goal. Now, it was given as good, but not yet as perfect in the sense of being complete, in that Johannine sense of true. God blessed man with the glory that he had as created, but he had an eschatological goal intended for this image, one that would realize in consummated union and communion with the triune God, no less. Nonetheless, the glory with which the protological son, that is Adam, was invested, did not remain in its pristine form. Adam fell from glory when he sinned by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as a result, he no longer imaged properly. If we think of him as a mirror, he was broken or marred or damaged. And the image was not lost entirely, but it was affected. It was damaged in all of its aspects. And now he's totally depraved. Adam lost dominion when he failed to keep the garden pure by succumbing to the serpent, Genesis 3. He was darkened in his understanding through the knowledge of sin, Ephesians 4.18 and Romans 1.21. And his flesh became subject to corruption and death, Romans 5.23, or 5.12 and 6.23. And though the glory image in man is in some sense remains, a la verses like Genesis 9.6 we spoke of in the pre-conference yesterday, it has been altered significantly. Now, this basic pattern of bearing God's glory image was recapitulated at a typological level. We have it in protology with Adam, image bearing, glory likeness. We have it once again at the typological level with another one of God's sons. But this is a national son, the nation of Israel. And like the protological son before them, the nation of Israel bore God's glory as typological son. Exodus 4.22 and following. Many other passages, Psalm 3, Zechariah 2. And as a type, the nation itself exhibited a form of the glory that anticipated the eschatological glory yet to be recovered and advanced unto consummation. The glory of the nation was most closely identified first with things like the tabernacle and the premier prophet Moses, and later with features of national life such as the temple and its worship. I believe 2 Corinthians 3 and 4 is a great explanation or a great example of this glory within the typological period of redemptive history. And it's in that passage where Paul focuses on the glory of God, which was shining in Moses' face. It was a manifestation of God's own glory. You can't think of the light shining off of his face as belonging to Moses. He's reflecting it 
But it was so significant that Moses had to place a veil over his face so that the Israelites would not look upon the glory directly and perish. That's pretty wild. But as great as that glory was, it was only provisional. And it faded. It was not original to Moses. It always depended upon him going before the Lord into the tent of meeting. Exodus 34, 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 18. So typological glory of this redemptive historical era was provisional by nature, but even it was forfeited. And just as Adam lost the protological glory when he fell in the garden, so also this typological glory did not remain. The nation of Israel fell after repeatedly breaking covenant. They fell from glory. They were exiled into Babylon, which is a typological hell. Just as Adam was cast out of the Garden of Eden, they too were cast out of the holy realm, Canaan, and sent off into exile. And in climactic conclusion to God's typological presence with the national image bearer, the glory of the Lord left the temple, Ichabod. Right? So where does that leave us in redemptive history? Even after two forfeitures, protological and typological, God's original plan of consummated union and communion remains. And it's still possible and achievable. But in God's plan of redemption, the eschatological son, the third and the final son of God, would come to redeem his people. But this image bearer differs markedly from the previous two. His experience of glory and his mode of displaying it are categorically different from Adam, Israel, and the rest of humanity. Because Christ is not simply a reflection of the divine glory, but he is the origin and source of it, the perfect image of the invisible God. Colossians 1.15, Hebrews 1.3, John 14.4, and 17.5. Though being the eternal God and partaking in the fullness of triune glory, think of that. Think of his existence. Though he be fully God, he took to himself the form of a servant. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him or any beauty that we should desire him. Rather, he humbled himself for a servant's life of suffering. Suffering unto glory. The hypostatic union here, the union between Christ's human and divine natures in the person of Christ has great significance for this bestowal, for our understanding of the bestowal of glory to God's people. So when you're thinking about the pattern of Christ's life, suffering unto glory, we need to think of it also in conjunction with this hypostatic union. And we need to recognize, if I'm Jim Caster, we've got to recognize that Christ's glory is original to his person and divine nature. But it changes in relation to his human nature. So this understanding of glorification then that we're going to develop, refracted through hypostatic union, offers a paradigm for understanding how glory is bestowed upon us, upon God's people who come to be united to Christ. See, Christ's life in between incarnation and resurrection glory was a redemptive historical movement that elevated his human nature to a consummative glory in closer relationship to his eternal glory as eternal Son of God. His human nature, the glory demonstrated through his human nature, is catching up to the glory he has always and forever as eternal Son of God. And that eschatological trajectory toward Christ's glorious climax is seen in stages throughout his earthly ministry. It was manifested when the angels confessed glory to God at Christ's birth. It was demonstrated as Christ performed miracles. But it breaks through even more strikingly at his transfiguration. You know, the glory that was demonstrated by Christ, the eschatological Son, is not substantially different from the glory demonstrated by the protological or the typological Son 
Indeed, it is the same divine glory, but we must underscore the fact that the mode and the fullness of the manifestation differs. This can be understood better by comparing Moses' glorious transfiguration to Christ's. Now, Paul connects the account of Moses' transfiguration to Christ's original glory. Believers are made to behold and see this glory through the Spirit in union with Christ. But in the transfiguration, the eternal glory of the Son breaks through in redemptive history with a foretaste of the eschatological glory that will adorn him in the fullness of his kingdom for all eternity. This is nothing less than the Trinitarian glory of God. The Son possessed it with the Father from all eternity, but he also functionally identified with the Spirit when his glory was manifested through his resurrection. And if Christ then came to restore the originally promised Trinitarian glory to his people by accomplishing redemption and offering a redemptive historical paradigm pattern to them, then it drives us also to consider how the transfiguration, how that so significant revelation of Christ's glory on the mount there might be prolectic of the believer's own experience. It's also necessary to understand the significant difference between Christ's original glory as eternal Son of God and the believer's manifestation of derivative glory which they receive as part of the body of Christ. And so for that, we need to consider the relationship between glory and transformation and to do so within the context of union with Christ. Now, Christ bestows his glory through a mystical and covenantal bond. We cannot speak about the image of God without speaking of covenant, for we must be in relation. An image is always in relationship. It stands juxtaposed to uh, the original. Otherwise, it doesn't image anything. And this stands in sharp contrast to those who would identify the hypostatic union as the conduit of ontological self-communication in the beatific vision. The nature of a mystical glorious bond between Christ and his people is described for us in different ways. It's not a departure or a bestowal of God's own nature so that we too would become gods or somehow merge and blend into God in some peculiar Hegelian sense. But it's a covenantal reproduction of the glory, a covenantal bestowal of God's glory into his people. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and 23. There, many of you may be familiar with the work of Richard Gaffin, and he does some excellent work on Paul's language Specifically, where Paul invokes the agricultural term aparche, or first fruits. And he does so to characterize this relationship of glory, which culminates in resurrection. Resurrection is the eschatological manifestation of glory. And Christ's resurrection is organically connected to the resurrection of those who follow in the harvest. And according to this conception or metaphor, the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of his people are not conceived as separate events, but rather it is a single harvest which is reaped in two stages. Now this has tremendous implications for the doctrine of union with Christ. For if Christ is organically connected with his people, in his resurrection, and if Christ's resurrection brought him glory, then union between Christ and his people must bear an important character and role in their glorification. And that means, that the means, I should say, the means of glorification must be circumscribed by several programmatic biblical texts. I want to look at two. One of them is Romans 8.29, which identifies the purpose of predestination as bringing the elect into conformity with Christ's image so that he could become the firstborn of many brothers. In other words, as we mentioned in the pre-conference, the resurrected Christ becomes the prototype for a glorified family resemblance. 
we become changed so that we begin to look more and more like our Savior who lives and reigns. But as significant as that text is, for an overall program of covenantal image conformity, perhaps the keystone passage, or at least one of the most significant as it pertains to many of the contemporary issues out there, is 2 Peter 1.4. So let's look at that. Image in nature, the aeonic interpretation of 2 Peter 1.4. I love when I get to use my Unicode characters. You see the, the A-E or uh, Jeff, what's that in Latin? The, what's, what's the name of that character? Do we know? Diphthong. You will. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's a diphthong. Combination of two vowels. There we go. Okay. Okay. Aeonic. That's trying to be kind of uh, fancy for, uh, it's the Greek word aeon, uh, and that means age. So we're speaking here of an, a two-age interpretation of 2 Peter 1.4. Now, theologians with an affinity to forms of divinization and deification often appeal to 2 Peter 1.4 in support of their views. And this is going to touch a little bit on what Jeff was speaking about nature earlier. But I believe that we can develop a two-age theology from this passage that will help us understand how precisely God is advancing the image of God. Look at this verse, 2 Peter 1.4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Partakers of the divine nature. Now, Peter's use here of that word nature, the Greek is phusis, phusis is extremely important since one's understanding of the use of this word will govern the interpretation of this text. Now, it's common to find phusis in ancient Greek, even in Greek philosophy. It's in several places, not an uncommon word. One way to consider phusis or nature is in terms of essentialism or in terms of a substance metaphysic. And in this sense, believers would come to participate in the divine life by sharing in the divine essence. That's not the only way people have taken it. And there are several, but I want to focus in on another way. The Pauline use of phusis is often aeonic, that is, with respect to the ages, redemptive historical ages. And it pertains to the relationship of this age to the age to come. This is evident in passages such as Ephesians 2, 3, which speaks of those fallen in Adam as by nature children of wrath. <clears throat> in this type of use, phusis refers to one's basic identity and to the characteristics that are concomitant with that identity. And that, I believe, is likely the sense in which Peter uses the word. Peter invokes an aeonic consideration in chapter 3, of his second epistle where he speaks about the last days. And he speaks of the world that then existed. He has two ages in mind. This isn't foreign to this letter. <coughs> Excuse me. In fact, he divides world history into three fundamental orders or ages. There was the flood that destroyed the world that then existed. There's the present world that will be burned up in a judging and purifying fire. And it will yield to a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. He's thinking of ages. This aeonic framework then is being employed in chapter 1, verse 4, when he speaks of the corruption that is in the world, ento cosmo, in the world, in a manner similar to Paul's aeonic language in Ephesians 1.10 and Colossians 1.16. I don't have time to develop this further, but I believe it is fitting for us to read Peter's second epistle according to a two-age eschatology. And in this case, partaking of the divine nature does not mean that we become gods or somehow merge into his existence, that we enter into some mystical perichoretic dance for all time, but rather that we come to share in some characteristic of the heavenly mode of existence which is in accord with the age to come. 
It is indeed surprising that this passage has been used as a foothold for all manner of philosophical speculation, particularly since Peter qualifies his intent in the same sentence, the very next phrase, which is divided in our English ESV by a comma, right? There he writes that partaking of the divine nature means having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. I take that as an explanation. Partaking in the divine nature in that interpretation then involves a new mode of existence, namely one characteristic of a new age. Thus, if partaking of the divine nature is a matter of escaping corruption, then we need to ask, when does that happen? Now, surely believers remain subject to physical decay and eventual death in this life. Yet, they also have already received new life in Christ and have been liberated from sin's corruption, not simply its guilt. This evokes the tension requisite to the overlap of the ages. We live in between grace and glory. And though Christ has been raised and his eschatological benefits intrude into the present, believers still endure the present effects of sin. You and I know that full well. Though they have been saved definitively, they await a final consummated deliverance when Christ returns. Now believers have escaped corruption in the eschatological sense but nevertheless experience it presently insofar as they experience the present age. If Peter's concern is to address the eschatological deliverance, we must consider this divine nature partaking in conjunction with other passages that address liberation from corruption. Meredith Klein, once again, summarizes her concern very well. He writes, in the vocabulary of Peter, partakers of the divine nature expresses renewal in the image of God. In the context of this expression in 2 Peter 1, the figures of reflective transformation and of investiture are both found. The former, with reference to the transfiguration of Jesus into the radiant likeness of the overshadowing glory, and the latter, in reference to to Peter's anticipated death, described as a divestiture, a negative counterpart to the resurrection investiture with glory. So, becoming a partaker of the divine nature means bearing the image of God, namely in the consummated form of the resurrected Christ. It is a likeness to the divine original as well as a bestowal, or in Kleinian terms, an investiture of divine glory. In salvation, believers escape the corruption that is in the world, which is a result of sin, by partaking in the likeness and the benefits of the resurrected Christ. So, we come to see then how the eschatological progression of glory for the person of Christ has significance for the eschatological bestowal of that same glory upon his people in redemptive history. This model I'm seeking to present elucidates, it clarifies, whatever, focuses in on Peter's eschatological conception behind the phrase divine nature. Divine nature. To partake in that, in the divine nature, is to be identified with the eschatos Adam, the last Adam, the final Adam, having escaped this world's sinful corruption by being conformed to his image, Romans 8, 29, and ultimately resurrected in consummate glory, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and following. This brings us to our next heading a Reformed Biblical Theological Definition of Glorification. So to appeal to my friend Ryan and my summer intern, he's, he likes to build up hot rods and used to race them. We've built the car, we put some fuel in it, now we get to go take it out for a ride. We get to rev it up and this is where we're gonna hit it hard. Having sketched now an aeonic framework of image conformity, 
as a biblical model for ep- explicating, can't even speak, explicating God's gift of himself, we may now attempt a succinct definition of glorification. I think this subject warrants its own full-length study. Maybe by the time I'm 50, I can finish one. But even an initial attempt will help us to address proposals of ontological self-communication and other competing theologies that are out there. The already not yet dimensions of glorification have not been fully explored by Reformed thinkers. It's kind of one of my hobby horses. And glorification uh, is often considered entirely in terms of a future event. What's your first thought when you hear glorification? What do you think? You think resurrection. When does resurrection happen? Bodily resurrection, at least. Happens when Christ returns. That's true. That is glorification. But I want to expand our horizon and see that that is requisite and necessary, but it's not all that God is doing in terms of glorifying us. You see, significant elements of glorification remain unrealized. For example, further degrees of glory and bodily resurrection. That's true. At the same time, Paul often speaks about the present reality of the new man. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. These aspects of glory are identified with the new creation. We experience them now. The new creation is yet to come, but it has already come. God's program of transformation then is not entirely future, but it has begun. It is inaugurated. Those whom the Spirit has called, regenerated, and united to Christ experience presently the new man right now. You who believe in Christ alone for your salvation have been raised in the new man. You reign in heavenly places. You are there with Christ. You experience that through your present existential union with Christ. You have been made alive together with him, seated in heavenly places in Christ. You rise to walk in newness of life. Having died to sin, you also have been and are being renewed. So in a very real sense, Believers already share in the glory of Christ and the hope of the glory to come. Namely, that which is inextricably linked with Christ's return and the transformation, which ensues as a necessary entailment of that event. Still, man awaits the consummation. Believers do not yet outwardly manifest the glory that they one day will manifest when they see their Savior face to face. For at that time, they will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Now a narrow view of glorification, which equates it and exhausts it with bodily resurrection, leaves open the opportunity to compromise the eschatological character of the salvific benefits. Yet, if we consider glorification more broadly, and according to a two-age paradigm here, as conformity to the image of the resurrected Christ, then each distinct salvific benefit becomes one component of God's overarching endeavor to make his people more like Jesus. These benefits are not then an end in themselves, a gift for their own sake, but rather contribute to us looking and being more like our Savior. For example, let me give you an example. The Reformed tradition defines justification as the imputation of Christ's righteousness and the acquittal of sin's guilt. By grace, through faith alone, we received and accepted as righteous in his sight. The Spirit imputes Christ's active and passive obedience to his people by faith alone, by grace, through faith alone. And therefore, by justification, God's people share in Christ's righteousness. But that's not an end in itself. It's necessary. It's significant, highly important. We have no gospel without justification. But it is not the gospel, such that other benefits are not the gospel, see? Rather, justification is one facet of the glory of the resurrected Christ. Adoption and sanctification also contribute to moving believers from one degree of glory to another. In adoption, believers 
are received into the family of God and become heirs according to promise. Through sanctification, the power of sin is broken and believers are set apart as holy unto the Lord. And so throughout the rest of their lives, the Spirit then continues to apply the death and the resurrection of Christ unto them, making them die increasingly unto sin and raising them unto newness of life. These distinct salvific benefits all contribute in particular ways to reproducing the image of the resurrected Christ in each individual believer. When you are justified, you look more like Christ. You are more like Christ. When you are adopted, likewise, now you are more like Him. When you are sanctified. And all the other benefits that either flow from or are accompanied by those three main ones. All of them are contributing to God's overarching plan to conform you into the image of the resurrected Christ. Justification, adoption, sanctification, no less than glorification, are eschatological in character as well. With respect to believers, they are already true, but not yet consummated. Think of this. The punishment for sin is death, both physical and spiritual. And as long as believers are subject to physical death, they live under the effects of sin. You will die unless Christ returns before him. The elect are absolutely and already justified in this present age. And there does not remain another justification. Do not hear anything of the sort from me. But hear this. The outward manifestation of that once for all acquittal from sin's guilt does not occur until the bodily resurrection. What are the wages of sin? What are they? And you will die. But you have been forgiven and acquitted. And not until you are raised from the dead, not just spiritually, but physically, are you entirely free, openly acknowledged and acquitted. There is an aspect. You are once for all justified. Hear me out. But the open acknowledgement and acquittal, the open manifestation, outward declaration of that once for all justification is not yet. Will not happen until you are raised from the dead. Furthermore, we have here an eschatological dynamic that is true with respect to adoption. Bodily resurrection not only marks the finality and consummation of justification, it also marks the revealing of the sons of glory, and it consummates adoption through the redemption of the body, Romans 8.23. So we can't say that adoption is some super benefit, but rather it alongside justification and sanctification within the context of union with Christ through the resurrection demonstrates God's glory. What does creation yearn for? To be liberated from the bondage of sin, to come through and triumph over the curse by God's grace, but it yearns most of all for the revelation of the sons of God in glory. So there's an aspect of our adoption, though I believe adoption also to be forensic. There is a transformative aspect only and insofar as that once for all adoption will be revealed, openly manifested to the world when we are raised from the dead. Furthermore, Sanctification is completed when believers are finally redeemed. When they are raised, they're no longer subject to the struggles of the flesh and are finally and completely confirmed in righteousness. All of these benefits come to consummation in glorification, but specifically that capstone of bodily resurrection. Each of these benefits, though, brings increasing glory to God as his elect progressively take on the form of the man of heaven. In contradistinction from the man of dust, koikos, dust man, become heaven man. We are being conformed to his image, reflecting his glory increasingly as the spirit applies Christ's death and resurrection to them, to us. Now, identifying this progress of glory exclusively with the bodily resurrection 
truncates the eschatological glory dimension of each salvific benefit. Still, that should never take away from the magnitude of the bodily resurrection when Christ returns. Bodily resurrection is the premier event of glorification. It is the capstone of it all. But by broadening the Reformed conception of glorification to include the not yet aspects of justification, adoption, and sanctification, as well as the already aspects of, ju of justification, adoption, and sanctification, then we may provide a more biblically and systematically informed position. Understood comprehensively. You'll see this in the handout. Gaffin basically, ha basically wrote this when I was talking. <laughs> this was for a paper. This, this paragraph was basically for a paper for him. So we had breakfast one time, and he basically wrote this. Although it's, it's <clears throat> basically. Glorification is a complex of salvific events summarized as the redemptive, historical, and progressive application to the elect of Christ's death and resurrection in all of its aspects, which culminates at the parousia in psychosomatic resurrection and marks the terminal point of this age and the consummation of the age to come. You have that written down so you can read it again later. It's all in there. That is what God is doing for us, making us like Jesus, making us like Christ, the original image. So to come all the way back to where we started, we asked, what does God desire? Heightened communion in glory, that perfected communion bond. How is that possible? Well, God gives the gift of himself, and he perfects our creaturely capacity to receive it, to grow in grace, to, to have communion with him. How does God achieve this? Well, he conforms us to the image of Christ. And I hope that means so much more to you now than perhaps it did an hour ago. Which image of Christ is the pattern to which we're being conformed? We're being conformed to the image of the resurrected Christ, first in his sufferings, so that we too might share in his subsequent glories. You see, we were created in the image of God, that original image was damaged, it was lost in the fall. But in the gospel, the spirit restores and surpasses that original state in which man was created. This image is renewed progressively and eschatologically in line with its own threefold character, which comes from Klein's language earlier that I quoted. First, the functional glory increases as man increasingly fulfills his mandate on earth and obeys the Lord. Second, his ethical glory moves from a state of simple righteousness to one of confirmed righteousness. And third, man's formal physical glory advances as each believer receives a glorified body and moves from a soma sukikon to a soma pneumatica. It's a natural body to a spiritual body, capital S spiritual. This glorification follows none other than the pattern of Christ's own life, a redemptive historical progression from suffering unto glory. Now to move toward a conclusion, while we recognize that this follows the pattern of Christ, we also must recognize that we are distinguished from him. And this is where Professor Tipton's lecture comes in heavily. Christ's archetypal experience is his own, and it is refracted through the hypostatic union. As Lagos Asarkas, his unfleshed word, the eternal Son of God possesses eternal, infinite glory, though in his human nature, even Christ progressed from one degree of glory to another. And in terms of the formal physical dimension of the image, he was moved, or he has moved from a soma sukikon to a soma pneumaticon. Christ himself was at one point in time for most all of his life on the earth, a natural body. It doesn't mean he was sinful. Let Dr. Tipton speak more about that some other time. You've probably heard it before on our programs. 
But Christ himself, according to his human nature, moved from a soma suchikon to a soma pneumaticon. Along the lines of the official dimension, Christ progressively exercised dominion over this aeon, this age, as he ministered and exercised his sovereignty through miracles, particularly over demonic forces operating according to the prince of the power of the air. And his kingdom progressively unfolded in power. If you see these works, he says, the kingdom of God has come upon you. That kingdom itself comes and grows. It's manifested progressively. Finally, in terms of the ethical dimension of the image, Christ grew in knowledge and in stature in his human nature. His act of obedience likewise progressed toward a consummation until it yielded his own soul, until he yielded his soul to death in his passive obedience. And therefore, the threefold image of God was glorified eschatologically in the human nature of Christ until that time when it is consummated in its fullness with the eternal glory that the Son possessed from all eternity. He never gave up his glory in heaven. He decided, I'm not going to be God anymore. But we see here that he has always existed in the eternal glory, but now his human nature, that glory becomes refracted in one way. And as that image is perfected in redemptive history, that eternal glory, which never changes, busts through in significant ways. It shines forth more and more brightly so that we see his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In his high priestly prayer, Jesus asked the Father to glorify him, quote, with the glory that I had with you before the world existed, end quote. Yet we know somehow he did not have that glory at the time of his prayer, at least in his human nature. But at his resurrection, Christ is glorified in his human nature such that that same original glory of the Trinity is now revealed in a consummate, though ectypal, sense through his human nature. Remember when Christ spoke to Philip, he said that if Philip had seen him, then he had seen the Father, Romans 14, John 14, 9. And that can be so because the Son of God lives in perichoretic relationship with both the Father and the Spirit from all eternity. And so to consider or to see, to behold any one of the divine persons is to consider, to see, and to behold the entire Trinity. Surely the persons of the Godhead are distinct, yet they are also inseparable. And given this Trinitarian life, with respect to the person of Christ, his glory is original and unchanging, though with respect to Christ's human nature, his glory is derivative and eschatological because it's refracted from his divine nature through his human nature in the hypostatic union. The Christian life then analogously recapitulates that movement from one degree of glory to another, circumscribed by the more basic and paradigmatic movement from suffering and humiliation unto glory. And this relates directly to Christ's life and glory, but not identically or exhaustively. For the image to which believers are conformed is an analog or an ectype of the heavenly archetype. That archetype, which is the triune God, perfectly imaged through the hypostatic union by Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. The glory that believers exhibit in their resurrection, therefore, is doubly derivative, though its source is always the Godhead. The light shines forth from God. It originates with him. It is mediated through Christ's human nature, and then it reflects off glorified images of Christ. So then, God's plan for the elect is to move them from one position of protological and anticipatory glory to a position of eschatological and consummative glory. And that eschatological program climaxes in nothing less than the beatific vision, 
which occurs at Christ's return when his people see him, when they are raised imperishable, and they become like him. 1 John 3, 2. Amen. We have any time? We do have time. We have some questions or thoughts um, on this lesson or anything else? Yes, Jeff. The mic behind you. Thanks, Camden. Um, I couldn't help but thinking about the final judgment looking forward. And I was looking in Revelation. It talks about the book, the books being opened. And it, I don't know if it's certain in the text, but it appears that there may be a time when both the elect and the lost are standing together at the judgment. Um, once they've been thrown into the lake of fire, and it says, then I saw the new heavens and new earth. But it, it looks possible, I'm just curious your thoughts on that or if you've thought about that. Is, sure. is there going to be a point, and I, I apologize for, I'm sort of thinking li in linear fashion, and chronologically. And maybe no, no, I think be. it fits in well. But is, is there a point where? I think there needs to be. The lost are gonna realize they're gonna see us and we'll all be standing in a group and there's going to be like, right. sort of like could have had a V8 moment, you know? Well, um, <laughs> there will be no repentance. It's not as if there are people, the sure. unbelievers are going yeah. to, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. Yeah. <clears throat> but at the same time, there isn't going to be necessarily any repentance um, or second opportunity, not that they would even want one, but yeah. there will be a general resurrection of the just and the unjust. When, when Christ returns, all in the graves will be raised uh, from the dead, believers unto glorified bodies, spiritual bodies, unbelievers unto bodies that will exist and persist for all eternity. And there also is a separation of the sheep and the goats. So how much we read that language and Christ's language about that separation into what you read in Revelation and the timing at which that perhaps is uh, an area or an opportunity for further study. But no doubt what is happening is a program of image conformity. I did not develop the other side of this. What we can do is look at Ephesians 1.3 uh, and you can consider that further, which speaks of us in our union with Christ, and it describes our union with Christ in uh, a threefold way. It is personal, it is spiritual, and it is eschatological. It's personal because we are united to the person of Jesus Christ. It is spiritual, capital S in this case, because it is through the Holy Spirit, a spirit wrought faith through which we're united. It's eschatological because it's heavenly directed and heavenly minded. Now, if we consider that paradigm, that framework, in how it works in Ephesians, and you can also compare in Colossians, because the two books parallel one another very closely. You can also see that Paul is, I believe, using that as uh, a bigger uh, form to describe image conformity, covenantal image conformity, aeonic image conformity, not only for believers, but also for unbelievers. We bear the image of the representative of our age. And so we, as believers who believe on Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, are being conformed into and confirmed unto the image of the resurrected Christ as last Adam. Everyone else is identified by the first Adam, and they bear his image. And when we read Colossians and Ephesians, particularly when he's speaking about the spirit of this age, and, and there, there are many passages, just read them parallel to one another, you'll see where this bears out that unbelievers bear an image to their covenantal federal head as well. And so we could think, now connecting that to the resurrection and to final judgment, we can see at that time a perfected image in both cases. It's a perfected image of honor, of imperishability, of uh, holiness, of glory for those who are represented by Christ, but it's a perfected image of dishonor, atomia, of death, of destruction, of perishability, and all that is entailed there, too. So I think that that is the, the flip side here to the antithesis and a, a consummation of 
God's justice and righteousness come upon now all who are identified with this age which is passing away, the world and everything that is, that is uh, summarized here. The Lord will do away with it all, and, uh, and uh, his justice will reign. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Chilling to think about. It is. But quite motivational. Um, and God well. is glorified, but we yeah. pray that the Lord would bring more people onto, onto the body of Christ. And that's what we yearn for. That's what we minister for, to bring every man or person to maturity in Christ, completion in him. Timothy? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. This question uh, is a reflection of all the messages. Um, and I thought of this after Jim shared his really helpful message mm -hmm. on the way that the image of God um, is reflected in humanity. In the battery might have died. Yeah. It's, it's all right. Yeah. The image of God, I can hear you. Yeah. That's fine. Um, we were talking about the one in the many. Mm -hmm. uh, so that there's a sense in Bobby builds on this. Mm -hmm. The image of God has been manifested in a very full way in not just the single male, but in woman, male and woman. Yeah. Male and female. Mm -hmm. um, can it also be said that when we look at the glorified church, uh, Christ's bride, mm -hmm. can we see people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation? There's a sense in which the image of God is fully manifested in the diversity of that unity. Yeah. One church, single focus on the one glorious Christ worshiping the Lamb around his throne. Right. Yet, uh, from every tribe, people, tongue, and nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and what could that possibly mean for the, the conscious mission of the church mm -hmm. pursuing other kinds of people? Right. Well, we certainly see that that's the prophetic future. That's the hope that we have. And in verses, uh, passages like Isaiah 2 and Micah chapter 4, we have that great hope and joy. That the nations stream to Mount Zion. And why? Because they want to come and hear Christ. But he is incorporating unto his own body people of every tribe, tongue, and nation. And that's a, a beautiful picture of the diversity of humanity, but a diversity that doesn't establish distinctions, but a diversity that's brought together in the person of Jesus. So that the dividing walls have been broken down. And so there's neither slave nor free, or male nor female, there's neither black nor white, but all are one in Christ Jesus. Right? We are brought together in him. But I love the picture of the diversity as well and thinking of the one and the many. What we see uh, with Bavink's teaching is very helpful to, to understand how humanity uh, manifests, the, the, I guess, the fullness of the image of God. But to bring this back to uh, the idea of covenant, image, the idea of bearing an image is dependent upon the relationship between original and the thing bearing the image or reflecting. I like using the image of, or the metaphor of a mirror. If there's nothing before the mirror, the mirror doesn't reflect anything. If there's no light, it doesn't work. It, it, the, the image that is in a mirror, as you stand before it, is dependent upon you standing before it. It's dependent upon you having a relationship to that image bearer, in this case, a mirror. Likewise, individual human beings reflect and demonstrate God's image, but they never do so independently. It's not like the image is copied or cloned in heaven and then God mails one to us or something, but rather it is uh, something that we bear and and reveal insofar as we are related to him. We're always related to God. It's either through the first or the second Adam. And we're always related to a covenant head. It's either to the first or the second Adam. And so that's how the image will take on different characteristics at that time. But now I want to I say this. Sometimes we can ask the question, does the spirit indwell each individual believer? Or does the spirit indwell the church as a whole? It's both. It's both. So we could say, how is the image borne out in believers, individually and corporately? Think of it. We have a relationship between the entire bride of Christ and Christ. They also have individual relationships that are not, dis they're not uh, different. 
you know, like, like, well, I've got my two relationships, you know, the, the Jesus with myself and then the, the church with Jesus. But we can see that how the, the unity and the diversity work together and how we can see that you as an individual image God in a beautiful and distinct way. But yet, as you also are united by the Spirit and the bonds of peace to a, a, a great diversity of believers around the world and throughout the ages, you too are one part, one member of that body. So that we can have a distinct building made up of living stones, but each of those living stones is unique. It, it, it is a singular shape that is not produced exactly or entirely by any other stone, so that there's one place for you. And that if you are not functioning or living or existing in that body, then the body suffers as a whole. But God is bringing us all to completion individually, and at the same time, and with the same terminal point, the same goal, he's also bringing to completion and finality and perfection the entire body. So it's both in. It's a one and many. Mm -hmm.